Good day to you, scholars. Yes, scholars. That's what people would call you when you attended school many long years ago in the United States of America. Let's take a step back into history, 100 years or more, and see how children went to school. We'll discover what their schools were like, who their teachers were, and how the scholars learned their lessons. Schools of the past were called country schools or one-room schools, and they were exactly that. Tiny little buildings also called schoolhouses. You might find schoolhouses built in fields, off in the woods, on dirt roads, in the center of town, or even next to old cemeteries. But people tried to build their schools close to the center of where most people lived, so children could walk roughly the same distance to school each day. There were no buses in the early days, so sometimes children had to walk two miles or more each way to school. Our schoolhouses were made of many different materials, depending on where you lived, and they came in many colors that the local people were able to decide for themselves. We often hear of the little red schoolhouse, but schools came in many colors. They could be white, or possibly yellow, sometimes blue, or even green, and they might even be unpainted if the town couldn't afford a couple of gallons of paint. They could be made of many different materials too. They could be made of wood, or brick, or stone, or logs, or even a hard packed earth that was called sod. People in the West, in states like North and South Dakota, would cut bricks of sod from the dry grasslands and stack them up to make walls of the schoolhouse. This was used when there weren't many trees for wood or stone for building. Some schoolhouses even had an attachment called a bell tower, where the town fathers installed large iron bells. The teacher would go inside the schoolroom, pull on a rope to ring a bell and call the children to school. When they heard that bell, they hurried not to be late. Most schools only had a hand bell to signal the start of the day. Schoolhouses of the past had some very interesting names. Imagine having a school that was named the Bellyache School, or the Snake Den School, or the Four Bear School. Even better, what if your school was called the Strange School? There was always a story behind the name. Sometimes they were named after the people who donated the land, or after some geographic feature close by like a mountain, or a hill, or a river, or after something in nature. They might be named after a famous person, like the George Washington School, or an event that happened in the area. They might have names like the Big Rock School, or the Moon Hill School, and sometimes they were just numbered, like schoolhouse number five, or number seven, or number 10. How do you think that they got the name of the Beehive School, or the Broken Bone School, or the Last Chance School? You've seen a number of square and rectangular schools, but there are also schools called eight square schools. They were shaped like today's stop signs, and they had eight sides. The teacher would teach from the center of the room. And we know of at least one little school that was built perfectly round. 
and that schoolhouse still stands today in Brookline, Vermont. Now some schoolhouses had one door and some had two doors where the boys would enter on one side and the girls on the other. Boys and girls were often separated on opposite sides of the schoolroom too. In many schools, when you entered the front door, there might be a small cloak room where they hung their coats and their hats and they stored their dinner buckets. Let's look inside a very early schoolhouse, way back in the 1800s. In this painting called The Country School by Winslow Homer, desks were slabs of wood that were fastened to the walls. The scholars sat facing the walls with their backs facing the teacher and she taught from the front of the room. They would have to turn around to read or recite for the teacher. You can see in this painting that the boys and girls actually sat on separate sides of the room. The littlest children actually sat near the front. In this painting, one little boy is crying because he probably doesn't want to be on the girl's side or he's just tired and he wants to go home. Eventually, most schoolhouses built the desks so that the children could face the teacher, sitting in a single desk or in a double desk with a partner. If you look around the room, you'll see that there are many windows to let in as much light as possible because for much of the country school era, there was no electricity and that was the only light they had. On the very sunniest days, there might be curtains or shades that they could pull to help block the sun. Attached to the walls, there was usually a blackboard that could be made of wood that was painted black so that the teacher could simply write their lessons with chalk. Or if they were very lucky, the school might have blackboards that were made of slate, which was a very strong black stone. On these beautiful smooth blackboards, those teachers could write a lesson, erase a lesson, and write another one, or they could call the groups up to work right at the board. The earliest schoolhouses were heated by a fireplace that was usually at one end of the room or eventually by a big, heavy, pot-bellied stove that needed wood or coal for fuel. You can tell by the shape of these stoves why they called them pot-bellied stoves. The bigger boys had to carry wood from the wood pile that was out the back of the school, or maybe from a woodshed, to keep that stove burning in the coldest of weather. You might ask yourself who taught in those little schools. Well, the early one-room schoolhouse could have either a man teacher known as a schoolmaster or a woman teacher known as a schoolmistress or school marm. Teachers were often young and inexperienced, but some were older ladies and men whose families might have been grown and gone. They worked very hard to teach all those children who actually ranged in age from about four years old to even 18 years old or older. These teachers taught kindergarten through the eighth grade in that one small room. And remember, there was only one schoolhouse for all the children who lived in a district. So you were even in the same room with your brothers and sisters. How would that work for you? In the early days of the 1800s, school was only open for about 10 or 11 or 12 weeks in the summer and maybe 10 or 11 or 12 weeks in the winter. They only had two school terms. There was no school in the spring or the fall because those were the very busiest seasons on the farm and children were expected to stay home and help with the farm work. As the years went by, the number of school days increased if the district could afford to pay the teacher. The teachers in our country schools were very, very hard workers. They taught every subject and every grade and every level from nine o'clock in the morning to four o'clock in the afternoon. They taught reading, writing, arithmetic, which you call math, history, English grammar, spelling, public speaking, and music. The teacher would call each grade to the front of the room for something called recitation. 
That's where the children would read out loud or answer out loud while the other students would be sitting at their desks waiting their turn and working on busy work. When they were sent back to their seats, the teacher would call another grade to the front for recitation and that went on all morning and all afternoon. You're probably wondering most about recess. Scholars had one hour off from 12 o'clock to 1 p.m. to eat and play. This hour was called nooning. Students would bring their dinner pails outside and play for most of the hour anywhere they wished, as long as they could hear the school bell at one o'clock calling them back to their classes. Scholars brought their dinners from home in something called a berry pail or a basket. Their mothers may have packed things like hard boiled eggs or apples or pears or maybe some buttered bread with meat, possibly some cornbread or cheese or sausages. In the winter, they might even bring raw potatoes to school that the teacher would put in a big iron pot on the stove. Students carved their initials into the potato so they, they knew it was theirs. By lunchtime, those potatoes would be hot and baked. The students' main drink would be water from a bucket that the bigger boys filled from the well many times each day. Children thought nothing of drinking from the same dipper. A second bucket of water might be kept in the room for washing hands, and once again, they often used the same bucket. Later, when they knew more about germs, schools would purchase water coolers and had the children bring their own tin cups to school. That was a much better system than the old bucket and dipper. If you had to go to the bathroom, the schoolhouse usually had one, or if they were lucky, two little outhouses in the back of the school, separate for boys and girls. These were little wooden buildings with wooden seats that had a hole in them. You would sit over the hole and you would do your business and it would simply fall down into a deep pit that had been dug underneath that shed. These little buildings were also known as privies, which was short for the word private. Sometimes the privy was called the necessary. I think you know why it's called the necessary. When you finished your dinners, nooning fun began. Scholars brought their own toys from home, simple leather balls maybe, homemade cloth dolls, wooden ring toss games, horseshoes, jacks, marbles, or maybe even Jacob's ladders. They could go swimming in the brook or they could go fishing, and in the winter they might even have snowball fights. They could play tag, snap the whip, hide and seek, drop the handkerchief, and many of the games that you still play today. They never wasted a minute of their nooning time. One o'clock, teacher rang the bell, children would file back into the classroom and work would begin again. Penmanship might be a good exercise to begin a quiet afternoon. You call it cursive writing. And paper was used mainly for penmanship. Until the 1840s, scholars practiced with ink and quills, which were actually goose feathers. Later, scholars practiced with steel tip pens that they dipped into ink bottles. Paper was much too expensive for everyday lessons, so students wrote their lessons on slates. The student slates were smaller versions of those blackboards that you found on the walls. Slate pencils that they wrote with were made of clay or a softer stone called soapstone. Slates could be erased over and over again with an old rag as scholars finished their lessons. And since slate was rock, it never wore out and there was never any waste at all. School books of the time were very scarce, so children had to bring their own books from home. They might even have to borrow books from a neighbor or a cousin or someone who had graduated from the eighth grade. The teacher never had a whole set of books for the class. In fact, she probably never had matching books for any grade or subject. The books were tiny in size and they were used over and over and over until they were almost worn out. The 
question is often asked how that one teacher could control all those ages and all those grades in that small space. While children were expected to be on their best behavior in those one-room schools, even though the teacher had a hard job to teach them all, they were polite and they knew their manners. They addressed their teacher like this, yes ma'am and no ma'am, or yes sir and no sir. The number one rule was no whispering, and scholars had to remain busy and quiet on their seat work all day long. But if there was some issue in that classroom about behavior, teachers were allowed to punish scholars who did not heed warnings to behave in class, and parents supported the efforts of the teachers to be good disciplinarians. Teachers were very creative in their methods of discipline in the schoolhouse. There were those who would keep you in from nooning time, but remember, that was a whole hour while your friends were out at play. And others might make you write over and over and over on the board what you had done wrong and what your promise was to be a better student. So now that you have a fairly good idea about life in a one-room school, you certainly might enjoy practicing some lessons that they used in those days. So maybe you'll give it a try when you meet up with your school marm. She'll share stories and materials from the days gone by of life in a one-room school. She'll have you reading in an 1800s reader, writing on slate boards, and dipping your pens in ink to do your cursive writing. Now until that day, remember to mind your manners and address your teacher, yes ma'am and no ma'am, and yes sir and no sir.